But we've been looking at a series of, of lessons on the, how the Beatitudes form the character of the Christian. That's the way every one of us should be, and we should have every one of those characteristics. So we look at ourselves as what we're supposed to be, then we also realize that when we become added to the church, that we are involved in being a member one of another, we see ourselves as brethren. We are brothers and sisters in Christ. We just don't have a relationship with Christ and then we go to the mountain somewhere and live in a cave. We live in the world and we're not of the world, but we're in the Lord's church and in localities, we see ourselves engaged in the worship services. Forsake not your assembling together. Uh, that's coming together in a local church. And so that relationship I wanted to see what all God says about that relationship is based upon the principles of the Beatitudes. It forms a base, this is what I am. Now how does that relate to the individual Christian I'm dealing with? And we see principles that are involved. And we'll see some involved uh, this evening in dealing with persecution, how we should handle that. So we come to this last lesson in this series, and we read, in, if you open your Bibles, please, to Matthew, the 10th chapter, 5th chapter, we read in verse 10, Blessed are they that have been persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Notice it's already happened. He didn't say blessed are those who will be persecuted for righteousness' sake. It would include them. But those already are. It's something that is going to be coming in the in the life of every Christian. And we, sh we see that in, in Scripture. So we want to look at what makes that blessed. Why is that a blessed state? Jesus explains it, as, we, as we'll note in just a few seconds, what he means by that. But then we say, well, that's, that's my character. Well, it's going to help us dealing with relationships with others, not only Christians. Perish the thought that Christians would persecute you. But persecution in the world that we see uh, can happen because we are Christians. So I want us to see the, we'll deal with the material as we answer the questions. I want you to see the application that we have there. So let's start with it. Do we have eight Beatitudes or nine in the Sermon on the Mount? We've looked at seven. Do you see two in verses 10 through 12? I see two blessedness. I see blessed are they when they reproach you and say all evil uh, about you. And then verse 11, blessed are ye when men shall reproach you and persecute you. Blessed are they that have been persecuted for righteousness sake. Blessed are ye when ye shall be re re reproached you and persecuted. I got two more blessedness and therefore I'll be, a, ought to be nine. But what do we see when we look a little closer? There's eight. What is that next blessedness doing? It's explaining it's explaining what is involved in being persecuted. So let's look at it. When you, blessed, are ye when, blessed are ye when ye have been persecuted for righteousness' sake. But there's the kingdom of heaven. Kingdom of heaven makes it a blessed state. It belongs to us. Blessed are ye when, when men shall reproach you and persecute you. I also know what's going on in persecution. He gives us a little more, wor another word that they're going to reproach you, they're going to upbraid you, when that's part of the persecution. They'll reproach you and persecute you and say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Isn't that explaining persecution? It does to me. I think it's there. It's, well, well, there's the kingdom of heaven. Well, what, what does verse 12 say? Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward where? in heaven in heaven and so he's he just elaborating on the fact the, the point he's made that there's one beatitude and this blessed state involves when people do some bad things against you hostile things against you because you belong to the kingdom of god and there's the kingdom of heaven notice that the first beatitude and our last beatitude has to do with the kingdom of heaven Blessed are the poor in spirit for what? Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. 
And when you are poverty of spirit and you become a citizen of God's kingdom, what goes to the territory is persecution, but there, the, the kingdom of heaven belongs to you. Your great reward is there. So I think there's eight Beatitudes. If you want to say nine, I, I guess that'll be okay. But explain yourself. Are we talking about different things in verse 10 than we do from verse 11? Or is it just an elaboration on what he's already stated in a concise point? Blessed, they that have been persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs to the kingdom of heaven. I think it's eight. All right, next, next question. How does the Greek word translated persecution denote both pursuing and fleeing? Well, it's interesting. The Greek word means pursue. I thought I'd be persecuted. I'm fleeing. If I'm persecuted, if you're persecuted, you're getting out of the way. You don't want that. That hurts. And pursuing, persecuted. I'm being persecuted, but there's a pursuing taking place. And what... How does that happen? Look at Matthew 10, 23. Here are the apostles, how they were to be, uh, have to react with persecution. It says that when they persecute you in the city, what do you do? They're pursuing you to persecute you. What do you do? I'm leaving town. I'm, I'm fleeing. Persecution connected with fleeing. I flee to the next. For verily I say to you, you shall not have gone through the cities of Israel till the Son of Man be come. I think he's coming in AD 70. Upon the, you'll, you'll preach the gospel, and that will, you won't have, you, you'll have that completed before this, the Son of Man comes. But we see in, well, Paul, in Paul's letters. But there's the persecution and the fleeing. If you note your outline, notice in Matthew 23, 34, not only will they kill and scourge you, but they'll persecute you from what? From city to city. They're going to persecute you from city to city. What did Paul do as Saul in Acts 26 and verse 11? He persecuted the church. He made havoc of it. He persecuted unto, even unto foreign cities. Pursuing. What was he doing on the road to Damascus? He looked for prisoners, Christians, to take back to where? Jerusalem. Well, just stay in Jerusalem. Oh, you can have Judea. No, I'm going to Damascus. I am pursuing the persecuted, and they're fleeing. And that's what we see in that word. So when you see the, uh, you go to the Greek word, you say, well, that means, it means pursuing. What does that mean I'm persecuted? I hope you could put those two together. Question three, what emotions fuel the hostile actions of persecution? Think about this for a moment. Is it an emotional thing when people persecute you? Oh, it's emotional to me when I receive. No, I'm not talking about. I'm talking about the persecuted, the persecutor, what the one who's doing the persecution. When we see in the scripture, what kind of emotion fuels that hostile action toward another person? It's rage. It's it's. Uh, it's not, it's not just, well, I'm calm. We don't see that in Scripture. Now, I, I put some Scripture here together. It, it's strong emotion. Now, you may have strong emotions for truth, and therefore you're going to pursue the one who's not teaching truth. I mean, that, that, that may be an aspect that he may think is persecution. But we're looking at, they speak falsely against you. We're looking at that type of persecution here in this beatitude. And we, we see this. For example... I just want to take one that will bring all of them together. Let's turn with me to Matthew, the 27th chapter. There's a number of passages here. I hope you able you, you meditated upon them. I hope you read them. I hope you thought, well, that's how this would apply. And, but Matthew 27 puts what happens in, uh, in Mark's account. Well, Jesus is on the cross. And I want to begin with verse 39. And I want you to hear them speak, the ones who are persecuting Jesus. And they that passed by railed on him. What were they doing with their heads? Well, they didn't do anything with their head. They just railed on them. What were they doing? They're wagging their heads, wagging their heads. Emotion. 
It's got to be an action. Shaking their heads. And what? I just can't believe Jesus is dying on the cross. They're mocking him. And saying, Thou that destroyest the temple and buildest it in three days, save thyself if thou art the Son of God. Come down from the cross. Did he make that statement? Destroy this temple in three days, I'll restore it. I'll build it back. Let him do it. So they take the words and they use it with derision. And they're fueled with emotion. If thou art the Son of God, come down from the cross. Did Jesus ever say he was the Son of God? Take his words, use it against him. At a time when he's hanging on the cross, let him come down from that cross. If he's the Son of God. In like manner, also the chief priests mocking from them with the scribes and elders saying, and this is where Mark's count comes in with the scribes. He said, he saved others himself he cannot save. He's dying on the cross. Mockery, derision. He's the king of Israel. Let him now come down from the cross and we'll believe on him. He trusteth on God. Let him deliver him now if he desireth him. For he said, I am the son of God. And the robbers also that were crucified with him cast upon the same reproach. They'll reproach you. They will speak evil of you. That's persecution. And Jesus is not fleeing. He can't. But what I'm saying is that it's going to be usually fueled with emotion. And they're not even putting his statements in their context. Don't care. We're going to mock him. And that's what, that's what they did. Now, this idea of upbraiding, uh, does God do that when we show ourselves that we lack wisdom in God? I'm praying to you. I lack wisdom. I don't know how to react in this situation. I'm asking for wisdom, and God says I, he, he will give it liberally. And why does he add this? And upbraideth not. They're upbraiding Jesus. They're reproaching Jesus. God does not give that gift of wisdom because we were needing guidance. He doesn't upbraid them for that. That's not the way God, he, he blesses us. He could, if, but that's not the character of God. These people were, were mocking him, and it's fueled with emotion. Let me give an example, and we won't look at each one of these, but turn with to Galatians, the first chapter. Let's look at Saul and persecuting Christians. Was he fueled by strong emotions in Galatians, the first chapter? Now, his standpoint, righteously so. He's zealous, and that can be good or it can be bad. You've heard my manner of life in the past, in the Jewish religion, times past, how that beyond measure, you go beyond measure, I persecuted the church of God. Why would you take it beyond measure? When you got your deed done, finish, back off. I went beyond measure. I went to foreign cities to get them. I made havoc of it. And I advanced in Jewish religion among many of my own age, among my countrymen being more exceedingly zealous. That's strong emotion. For the traditions of my fathers. He was dedicated to the traditions. Not what the law should be, as the Jews failed to do. But he was striving for that. And so, but when it was God's good pleasure who separated me, even from my mother's womb, called me through uh, grace to reveal his, his son in me, he says, I didn't confer with flesh and blood, I went. But he was zealous. He was persecuting them above measure. He was doing that. And uh, that, that's the way he was. Now, look at the terminology that he uses in describing that. Acts 26, 11, he says he was exceedingly what? Mad. Is that strong emotion? He's not mad. He's exceedingly mad. Breathing, threatening, and slaughter. Acts 9 and verse 1. He just, the air is slaughter. That's what he breathes. Like a horse flaring his nostrils. He's running hard. He is, he's just breathing and expanding with slaughter. That's what kept, kept him going. Exceedingly zealous. And so when you look at 
the persecution. Sometimes what makes it so cruel is the fact that it is so full of the emotion of wanting to destroy someone or to tear down what Jesus claimed for himself. And that's what is in store for the Christians. So it's not going to be something that someone does. There's some be cold-hearted that will just cut your throat. I understand that. But a lot of times it's wagging that head. It's full of emotion. They, Luke 6 says they hate you. Hatred involves emotion. Just be just alert to that when, when you see that taking place. Explain why every Christian will suffer persecution. And we're not looking at Christians who are fair-weather Christians. We're talking about what the Christian is. Explain why that is so. Can you do that from the Scripture? I hope from this Scripture that you have, you could. 2 Timothy 3, 12 steps says you better start thinking about it because everyone that lives how? Godly. Will, will, not shall, maybe, will suffer persecution. Now, my point is, why is that? And John 15, 19, 20 tells you. If you are of the world, the world will love you. But you're not of the world. I chose you out of the world. So the world does what? Strong emotion. They hate you. They hate you. And they're going to say all manner of evil against you. All the things that are involved in persecution. In fact, in X, 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 8, X 14, 22, he just going back to Lystra, going back to the cities that have persecuted him, you've got to realize we all must be, go through persecution. So we must enter the kingdom of God. We must enter the kingdom of God? Yes. Well, you will suffer persecution. Somewhere down the line, when you take a stand for the righteousness that Christ has revealed in the gospel, somewhere, somehow, some form, we will all suffer persecution. Just get ready for it. And what Jesus is doing is preparing us for that fact. Any, any questions on those first five or anything you want to add to it? Yes, David. That's right. Yeah. No, that's, that's, that's a good point. And sometimes that's all they have left. They, they, they don't have the reasoning or arguments about it. They're just full of emotion. They're going, you contradict them, that's going to be the end of it. What is a synonym for suffering for Christ's sake? We talk about Christ's sake. Let's notice it. Do we see that in Matthew 5, 10, and 11? Is there, although, although, what is the synonym for Christ's sake? What do you think? Righteousness sake. Yes. I think that's exactly right. In Matthew 5 and verse 10, blessed are they that have been persecuted for righteousness sake, for there's the kingdom of heaven. And so, blessed are you when men shall reproach you and persecute, say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. You're living a righteous life, and that is Christ's sake that you're also living. And usually, well, for Christ's sake, that just, that, ain't, that involves so many things. No, it involves being right with God. Not error with God, right with God. For righteousness sake, where do we find righteousness revealed to us so that we can go to it and, and nail down what righteousness is? For therein is the righteousness of God, Romans 10. And that, that point is being made how to make you righteous to become a Christian. It's by our faith in Christ. But that continues as a Christian as we always come back to the standard of, of righteousness. So those things are uh, indeed a synonym. All right? Any comments? All right, let's look at the next question. Suffering can come from blank doing as well as blank doing. And I didn't put this passage in there. I wanted you, or what he, where, what's he talking about? I wanted you to dig. I wanted you to find it. And it comes out real clear in a passage that has to deal with persecution. And I'll give you a hint. The passages I have there is 1 Peter. 
And that's the hand I'm going to give you. Anybody answer that one? I mean, all you're doing is staying at home, aren't you? That's right. First Peter 3, 17, that's, that's right. For it's better if the will of God should so will that you suffer for well-doing than for evil-doing. Good and evil. So I can suffer for doing evil. Is that true? I helped burn down the third precinct in Minneapolis, and they found I stole things, and they, I had my name in it. I think they're coming to get you. And you'll probably have to suffer for that. Stealing. Murder. And that's evil doing. You'll have to suffer, but the Christian is not supposed to be doing the evil doing. Uh, it's supposed to be doing the well doing. And you can still suffer for that. That's exactly what Jesus had to suffer. He didn't deserve to pay the penalty for our sins, but he did. The righteous for the unrighteous. And he was doing well. No sin. Facing the persecution. And we, we pattern ourselves after, after him. And we see it in 1 Peter 2, 20 and Chapter 4 and verse 15. And, and while we're looking at that, what is the, what is the evil doing? If, if a man suffers as a murderer, as a thief, 1 Peter 4, 15, as an evildoer, doing that which is evil, or a meddler in other men's matters. Does that happen sometimes? When you cross the line, you get involved in somebody else's business and they don't like it, or can you suffer persecution? Well, in this context, is that good doing or evil doing? Where did God put it? Thessalonians were minding other people's business. They weren't working. And we need to make sure we, we walk that line, too, because that's the line between well-doing and evil doing. Busybodies. And that's where we say, well, no, my, my character is such that I'm going to be uh, paying attention to that because I can be persecuted. I'll make my, I feel, uh, I, I got my feelings hurt. I'm just trying to help. And when's that line trying to help and when you're a meddler? I don't know if I got the answer, but I'll tell you one thing that helps. If you look at where another person's coming from, instead of I'm going to do good, you care enough to look where another person's coming from most of the time, you'll make the right decision. When it's all about you, and that's all you're thinking about, I'm going to do good. I can, I can solve this problem. But when you think where another person's coming from, it'll help you. Next question. Why is this important in our lives? I gave you an example. Anybody else want to add to that? Why understand that distinction about persecution? What is the method often used in persecuting others? Oh, there's a, there's a method, and you'll see it repeated over and over again in life. I pick one in the life of Jesus. If you turn with me to Luke, the 16th chapter, this is in your outline. I hope you studied it and looked at it a little bit, uh, and we'll, we'll look at it now. Jesus has been even given a a parable of the unrighteous steward that he showed wisdom of the world and that when Jesus was saying that we need to have that kind of wisdom when we're dealing with things but it's the idea of love of money he comes up with to in in verse 13 no servant can serve two masters either he'll hate the one and love the other or else he'll hold to the one and despise the other you cannot serve God and mammon what was mammon when he says mammon what is that a synonym to, with? To. Yeah, riches. And we say, well, it's a god of mammon. We talk about the god of mammon. Uh, uh, and someone said, well, that, that was the name of a god. But it's, it's a riches. And so here's the desire to get rich. Paul warns T Timothy to tell the brethren there in Ephesus not to get involved with that. And that's always a, a problem. Well, Jesus is dealing with that, and who's listening to him that day that he's speaking this parable before them? Well, the Pharisees. 
And what do we see in verse 14? And the Pharisees who were what? What were they? Lovers of money. When they heard all these things, they said, you know what? Jesus, tell us what's the difference between lovers of money and good stewards of money. Now, let's have a, let's have a uh, discussion about this. Nah. What do they do? When you can't handle the truth, what do you do? You scoff at him. See, if you tear him down or tear her down, you've just justified your position according to the way the world thinks. And it happens over and over and over again in life. They scoffed at him. Instead of them, ye are they, and Jesus says, ye are they that justify yourselves in the sight of men. That's the second prong of the method. I will look good in the sight of men, not in the sight of righteousness. I'll look good in the sight of men, and I will tear you down with my mockery, my ridicule, my blasphemy, all, all the different tools they have. That's the method. And Jesus faced that. And you will face that in life, and living as the life of a Christian. Because that's what happens in persecution. And that's what makes it hurt. Well, Jesus was, did Jesus have a bad attitude when he said in Luke 16, taught that ideas about the riches and all, there wasn't any uh, bad attitude in Jesus. I agree with what you said, don't like the way you said it. It wasn't that. I mean, Jesus, <laughs> he's perfect. So all they had in their arsenal was that tear him down. And tear him down in the eyes of the people because all we want to look good is justified in the eyes of the people. He said, that's what you do. But what you're doing is an abomination in the sight of God. God hates it. And if you know the method, you can endure the persecution. Knowing that's what they got. And that will often take place in the areas of persecution. Why did Jesus call the reward of heaven a great reward? It wasn't just a reward. Why is it a great reward for the persecuted Christians? Yeah. That, I think that's true. The, the nature of that life uh, is, is true. The, it's eternal. I can deal with the the thing now, because I know there's something greater, because it's eternal. This is not e eternal at, at all. Uh, Paul, I think, talks about this, this eternal weight of glory that uh, I think we had in our, in our outline, that uh, that's what we have before us. 2 Corinthians 4, 17 and 18. It's eternal weight of glory through our, but see, it's through our afflictions. And Moses is a good example of this in Hebrews eleven twenty six. He saw greater riches. He was suffering with the people of God, counting, you know, counting greater riches with suffering for Christ than, than the uh, riches of the treasures of Egypt, for example. So there's a big treasure, and he would have access to that. But he'd rather suffer the reproach of God's people because he looked for the recompense of reward. You, you'll get rewarded in Egypt, <laughs> but this was a greater reward because it's eternal it's a reward of, from God, and it's, it's greater in its character. And that's true. But isn't that reward going to be sweeter? When you have suffered for not doing bad or doing stupid, but suffering for righteousness sake, standing for the truth of God from what you have in God's word, and standing with that, doing what's right, and I think heaven will be pretty sweet for that because that's what you had to endure. And people mocked and they tried to tear you down to justify themselves. And you had righteousness up here. Why can't we go there? And they didn't want that. And the world doesn't want that. That's why we're not like the world. We'll suffer that, 
that persecution. I think through the afflictions, oh, the reward's sweeter. It is a great reward because there's justification by one who matters, God. And I don't want to justify myself in the sight of men in areas where God, it's an abomination to God. And when we see the wisdom that comes from God in heaven, it's always first pure, then peaceable. Always pure first. We're going to establish that first. Then we can have peace with God. Then we can have peace with one another. A lot of people don't want to go that route. And the world doesn't care about having peace with God. So they're going to, to treat you that way. And I just think he's just saying it's going to be a, a great reward there. And that's something we can look, that we can look forward to. Any, any more points about great reward? He just, great is your reward in heaven. All right, let's look at the next one. How do you know that Jesus had being killed in mind? That's the ultimate persecution, as far as our walk up on the earth is concerned. How do you know he had being killed in his mind when he's speaking of the Christian's persecution? It is safe. They'll kill you, but yeah, he had that in mind. How do you know that? Let's go back to Matthew 5. And I'll show you why I think he had it in mind. Because he says in verse 11, or verse 12, rather, Rejoice, be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For, explanation, when you see a far, you're going to look down as something what it's based upon. When you see a therefore, you're going to rise above something. Something's established, therefore something comes up. That you're going to, it's at a new plateau. When you look at for, you're looking at something that undergirds it, that, that is a reason for this. So you're, working, you're going downward. I want to see what, what you had in mind. And he says, Rejoice to be exceeding God, for great is your reward in heaven. Why? For so persecuted they the prophets that were before you. Now, what kind of persecution did the prophets go through? They went, they, went through, they went through death, didn't they? And we see that a number of places. I gave you some, some example, but in Matthew 23 and verse 30, uh, that they killed the, the prophets. Uh, go back to the Old Testament, that they're going to kill those that God sends unto them, they, and that's the Pharisees, they'll kill them. But we see back in the, back what, how they persecuted the, the prophets before you. So we're looking ahead. And see, it's important to persecution. You're looking ahead, and then you're looking back. I'm looking ahead, the great reward. I'm looking back, they kill prophets. They may kill me. And you've got Obadiah hiding a hundred prophets in the days of Elijah, while Jezebel was killing the prophets. Elijah confesses that, affirms that in 1 Kings 19.10. He thought I was the only, he's the only one alive left. Nehemiah 10, 9.26, there's a confession of sin. In the days of coming back from captivity, he said, they turned their backs on the law of God. And God sent his prophets to get them to change their minds, and they slew them. They killed them. Jeremiah, in Jeremiah 26, 23, you had a prophet. They went down to get him out of Egypt. And the only reason Jeremiah was saved in verse 24 is because they had a guy taking care of him. They had to kill Jeremiah too. And so all these passages, one in Hebrews 11 Historians say that sawn asunder, that was how Isaiah died. Sawn asunder. Found him in a log, hiding. And they sawed him asunder. It may be tradition, may be just story. But the Bible says people were sawn asunder. Persecution can mean our death. Is that something that is happening today? Now, I'm, not, I'm talking about Christians and the way they, they consider themselves Christians. All over the world, people are being put to death, let's just say, for their faith. They may have the wrong faith, but the point is, is that the world and religion, uh, they're not mixing. And people are dying. He said, well, that's just back in the Old, that's back in the New Testament, Old Testament. It's today, and it can happen uh, at any time. Okay, we, I think we have two more. When persecuted, what two steps must a Christian take on the way to rejoicing in being persecuted? Because when you're persecuted, it's not joyous. It hurts. 
Thank you. So, what has God revealed in his Bible that's helpful? That when there'll be a, there'll be a couple of steps that you have to take before you can really rejoice in being persecuted. We've already seen the character of one. And this is where you begin. Blessed are the meek. They're going to inherit the earth. Meek men don't inherit the earth. You've got to be aggressive. You've got to retaliate. You've got to fight back. You've got to be a man. You want to be a man for God. And you've got to be a man or woman for God. What did we say about meekness? And the greatest one is in Numbers 12 with Moses. He was the meekest man in all the earth. And you look at that context. What made him meek? He was, he was, he was aggressive. But that occasion, he was the meek one. Why was he meek? Or how was he meek? What did it look like? He just a kind of a humble person? No. He absorbed everything that his brother and sister were saying against him. He absorbed it. He said, not a word. That's meekness. And God vindicated him that day. His sister got leprosy. And that's the point that I'm in control of the earth. I'll give it to you. The blessings you have the earth. You just stay, stay with me. But the meek person is the one that does not retaliate when persecuted. You just absorb it. Well, is, is that what Jesus did? In 1 Peter 2, in verse 20, we read where we're to follow his example. Now, this is why I'm looking at, at, my, at the, my Lord and how we should be. What glory is it when you sin that you're buffeted for it? He says, for you shall take it patiently, but if you do, but if when you do well you suffer for it, you shall take it patiently. This is acceptable with God. For her and two were you called. Slaves, you were called to be persecuted. So will brethren. Because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example, something that's struck in stone, if you please, that's sitting there and it's anchored for all to see. That you should follow his steps. Who did no sin didn't retaliate with evil, who had no guile, was found in his mouth. When he was reviled, what did he not do? He absorbed it. He reviled not again. When he suffered, fought back. No, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously. God will take care of the persecutor in the judgment. You can bank on it. And right now, at this point of persecution, you just got to endure it. You're not, you're not happy about, about this. You're enduring that. And realizing that's part of being cleansed by the Word of God abiding in that. The second step is that you'll find yourself not resentful. Not resentful. After a while, you realize, no, I, that's not true. And I fear all the stuff, you're, you're just battling that. But you become not resentful. And look at Paul in 2 Corinthians 6 and verse 10. When, can, can, can you make sense of this? When he says in chapter 6 and verse 10, as sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. How can you be rejoicing and at the same time being sorrowful? I just called it glad agony. Glad agony. Not resentful. Goes with the territory. I'll just keep enduring. 1 Corinthians 4 and verse 12. And when you get through those two stages, what are you looking for? You're looking for heaven. That's going to be a great reward. Now help me endure it now. But before you can get to the joy of that, you're going to have to work on yourself. And meekness is character. And not retaliating, but the idea of not being resentful. People can become bitter in times of persecution. You've got to get past that. And Paul did, glad agony, <laughs> if you can understand that. 
the last thing I, I think uh, well let's add this to it where must my heart be placed to rejoice in being persecuted I think I have the word I in our outline we'll correct that but I mean where must my heart be placed to rejoice in being persecuted for Christ and righteousness sake where's your heart going to have to be it's going to have to be in heaven looking ahead no one behind looking ahead now if you have your outline I've often wondered, and I think, what would it be like if I'm going to be burned to the stake tomorrow for my faith? And it happened to people. Uh, Riley speaks, not our Riley, but Riley, an author, spoke, uh, he read a, wrote a book on light from old times. He said, John Hooper's letter, written three weeks before he was burned to the stake in England in A.D. 50, 1555, he said this, you must now turn all your thoughts from the peril you see and mark the felicity that followeth the peril, looking to heaven. Beware of beholding too much the felicity or mis misery of this world. This is going to be painful. This is horrible. You can't look at that. For the consideration and too earnest love or fear of either of them draweth from God. And you don't want to turn away from God. And why you look at the statements that people who are professing to be Christians make, it was just a heart totally in heaven and could say gracious things after one was whipped unmercifully. It's just you struck me with a rose. You struck me with a rose as he looked at the man who beat him and could react that way. Glad agony. It hurts. But that's the conduct, that's the character of the Christian. And we'll, we'll close. Put your heart in heaven and you will endure a lot of things. And you won't retaliate and you'll follow the example of Jesus. Because that's what you ought to be. Thank you.